So, um, we seem to have lost a few people to lunch, but I, I'm certain they will be back in a few minutes with the weather looks correct outside. I really appreciated how this morning a lot of people had rather uh, uh, incisive questions, and I, I, I think we should keep up that, uh, that mode. I think in order to have such incisive questions, there would be important people not to be on their laptop for the time. So, uh, please, uh, if you're an organizer or not, please stay off the laptop. Um, great. So our first speaker is Eric Edelberg. So I'd like to uh, thank the organizers very much for inviting me to a, a very interesting conference. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm here a little bit, uh, I have to make a disclaimer. Uh, whoops, why is that doing that? Uh, the disclaimer is that I, I will not uh, talk much about quantum optomechanics. Uh, I'm here to learn about the amazing uh, progress that's being made in that field. And uh, so my role here is maybe just to uh, amuse you. Uh, the torsion oscillator in our tests, uh, for example, has a period of 400 seconds, which is very long compared to the uh, periods you, you people are talking about, has a uh, spring constant in units which are, uh, I like to use, ten, uh, 210 to the 10th EV per radian, it operates at 300 K, and it has test bodies that have, you know, a um, few, few moles uh, of nucleons. The oscillator's ground state uh, energy is only uh, 5, 10 to the minus 18 EV. And compared to its thermal energy, which is, is you know, it's tiny compared to its thermal energy, which is uh, 30 milli EV. Okay. But this uh, thermal energy, uh, 30 milli EV, corresponds to a uh, you know deflection angular deflection of the pendulum which is uh, microradian and we can resolve nanoradians so you know we, we can uh, we, we, we can see something but the interesting thing is that the experimental sensitivity itself is surprisingly good if uh, the way we do these experiments in general is we have a torsion pendulum and we have some attractor and we all re, you know reorient either the attractor or the detector so, uh, to change uh, the signal. Uh, and we let that orientation angle be phi, and then the sensitivity is basically how accurately can you measure the twist of the pendulum, let's say, if you rotate the attractor by a sufficient amount that you go through one complete cycle of the tor torque on the pendulum. Okay? And that number is tiny. And the smallness of that number is what makes the, the stuff interesting. Okay. Now I'll just go back, and uh, the people involved uh, are listed right here. And uh, we're involved in quite a uh, selection of experiments, and we're supported by the National Science Foundation, for which I'm very grateful. Okay. And uh, we're doing a bunch of different things, all hooked up with uh, gravity, quote, uh, testing the principle of equivalence, uh, looking for uh, possible violations of the inverse square law of gravity at short distances, uh, testing uh, for preferred frame effects at a remarkable level of sensitivity, and uh, searching for exotic uh, Goldstone bosons. Uh, I'll just talk about the two middle topics. And, uh, but uh, it turns out that the real problem in these experiments is not the sensitivity, okay? even though I gave you that tiny number. Okay, the real problem is making sure that what the forces that you are measuring are what you think they're from, okay? In other words, are you studying gravity or are you studying uh, something else, okay? And uh, most of the something else is associated with surfaces, okay? So that's a little cautionary thing in the sense that if you're going to go to microscopic objects, to study gravity, of course, their surface to volume ratio 
is not favorable. Okay. Uh, and just a little motivation for this, uh, and I won't dwell much on it, is you know that connecting gravity to the rest of physics is a very deep uh, problem in fundamental physics, and you know there is one shining knight riding up on a horse uh, uh, in, in string theory, and the interesting thing is that it predicts all kinds of stuff which you have to hide from experimenters, okay? Because they're manifestly not there. You know, lots of extra. I mean, manifestly means that you can perceive, right? It doesn't. That's the meaning, okay? Uh, you know, seven extra dimensions, okay? Hundreds of scalar particles with, with nominally gravitational couplings and very low masses that would mediate new kinds of forces and so on. And uh, a lot of this stuff can show up in these kind of tests I'm talking about, okay? And uh, so in order to test something, you have to have a way of parameterizing a violation of it. And the modern way is to say, is in addition to the inverse square law, is there a Yukawa term, which is what you'd get you know, uh, if you had some boson exchange process going on. But it's, it's actually a convenient way to parameterize any kinds of violations. But the point is, it has a dimensionless number, which is its strength relative to gravity. And it's got a length scale, which is the Yukawa scale. And uh, th there are some length scales which are potentially uh, quite interesting. Namely, we know that there is this dark energy that pervades the whole universe. It hasn't apparently, its density has been constant as the universe expands. Uh, it has apparently not changed appreciably over the lifetime of the universe. And you can take that dark energy density, which is about 4 keV in every cubic centimeter, and derive a length from it by using uh, Planck's constant speed of light. And you can get a kind of a new Planck length, okay, based on this uh, measured dark energy density. And that's 85 microns. And so that uh, says that, you know, studying gravity at uh, below the 85 micron level uh, is potentially an interesting thing to do. Okay. And uh, one of the re uh, things that got us started in this business is the idea of uh, 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 Arkani Hamed, Demopoulos, and Diwali that said, you know, there is a way you could maybe explain why gravity is so weak compared to everything else in this string brain world, okay? The idea is that, we, uh, that uh, the theory is not only a theory of little strings, but it's a theory of surfaces, if you like, generalizations of surfaces. And we supposedly live on one. Every, all the other particles of nature, except the one responsible for the gravitational force, have some kind of charges on the end, and they're tightly stuck to this brain. And only gravity can propagate in the extra dimension, which is this direction. Okay? And so the idea is, if you want to learn about these extra dimensions, the one way you can learn about it, and the only way, in this picture is by studying gravity. Okay, so it's sort of a, a nice uh, twist on Einstein, who said, you know, in not so many words, that you know that gravity is geometry. Okay, and uh, the picture is here. Uh, you suppose this is one of the curled up dimensions, uh, the extra dimensions, a curled up one, and here is one of the ordinary dimensions. Uh, we're constrained to work along this line here. We stick down a point mass. And we ask, how do its lines of force spread out in this uh, cartoon? Well, when you're at short distances from the point mass, they can spread in two dimensions. But then they can no longer spread, and they become parallel. And so if you move a second point mass along this axis, which we can do, we're free to move along this axis, you will see that the strength of gravity in this case changes from being constant to a, uh, a, a 1 over r. Uh, a one over our force as you get in closer. And that's just as Gauss's law is changing from Gauss's law in one dimension into Gauss's law in two dimensions. Okay? And uh, so this is uh, the instrument we used in our latest published uh, experiment. We've got two others going, I'll mention in a minute. But this is an object hanging from about a meter long fiber. Uh, it has, uh, a, you know, it's about the size of my fist. Uh, the active element in it is this ring here that has. Uh, two sets of 21 holes around its circumference. And uh, we shine a light beam off of one of these mirrors here, measure its deflection to determine the angle of this thing. And underneath, uh, there rotates steadily a similar hole pattern. Okay? And uh, the idea is if there weren't holes in the detector ring and there weren't holes in the uh, attractor disk, okay, then gravity would simply pull straight down here. There would be no signal 
uh, indicating to you that this thing was turning underneath. Okay? But because of the holes here, what you're effectively studying is the gravitational interaction between the missing mass in this upper set of holes uh, with the missing mass in the lower set of holes. Okay? And then to uh, reduce our sensitivity to the scale factor, uh, this attractor that rotates underneath is actually two pieces that are uh, assembled together. And the piece below has a similar hole pattern, but the holes are bigger. They're deeper here, four times deeper. And uh, they're situated halfway in between the holes here. And the idea is it's been designed so that if Newton were right, the torque on this uh, upper detector ring caused by the rotation of the attractor alone, okay, uh, would be a, would have components that whether Newton's right or not, it would have components at 21 times the rotation frequency, 42 times 63, and so on. Okay, uh, that's a good feature because as you turn this, you inevitably disturb something. Okay, and so our signal is at a high multiple of that frequency. We can measure the frequency of rotation very accurately. We know exactly where to look at the frequencies in our detector. And we've engineered it with this dual attractor here so that the torque at 21 times the rotation frequency, from now on I'll just call it 21 omega, okay? The 21 omega torque on this thing due to the upper attractor ring is uh, equal in magnitude to the torque on this ring from the lower set of holes, but exactly out of phase. And so if Newton's right, these two signals nearly cancel. And on the other hand, uh, if there's something new going on at short distances, you will see its full strength simply because the bottom set of holes is too far away. Okay? The force would have died out. Okay. And uh, this is a picture of uh, the thing. Okay. Uh, what you see here when you look through the holes, you, you, you see another... Uh, it looks like a, 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 another golden surface down there. That's a very tightly stretched, uh, gold-coated, uh, 10 micron thick beryllium copper membrane. The idea is, if you had done the experiment like shown here, you would measure garbage. Okay? You'd measure garbage simply because among the many things they didn't teach me in my excellent education at Caltech was that a, a conductor is not an equal potential. Okay? A conductor, uh, the potential above the surface of a conductor of metal, uh, even if it's a perfectly pure uh, metal, okay, varies by 100 millivolts if you have a small probe in close, due to the fact that the little microcrystals of the, uh, uh, of the copper, let's say, have different orientations, and they didn't also teach me that the work function of a material is not just a number, it depends which crystal face you're talking about. Okay? And that difference in work functions off different crystal faces of materials is, you know, a reasonable fraction of a volt. One reason we use gold is that the difference is uh, quite small for gold. So we coat everything with gold. There's a gold-coated uh, membrane between the attractor and the detector, and there's a gold-coated house that sits around the whole thing with a hole in the top for the fiber and a hole in the side for the light to go through. But otherwise, you have this golden thing sitting in a little golden box. And the idea is it should have no way of knowing what is going on underneath except by gravity. So that's what you would like to have be true. And this shows just the attractor. It's very important to line all these things up. And at the micron level, this is a painstaking job for which we are thankful there are graduate students. And uh, this shows that uh, foil that separates the, uh, the two, the attractors underneath this. The foil, you can see a faint line here. Everything below that faint line is just a mirror image of what's above it. So it's a very tightly stretched foil. It's very rigid. Uh, it doesn't deflect under Casimir forces and potential differences and so on. Okay. And this shows a power spectrum of the twist signal. Okay. And it's in units of the rotation frequency of the attractor underneath. And uh, you see a peak here at uh, 1 omega. That's what I'm saying. You can never make something so perfect that there isn't something coming through at the disturbance frequency. Okay. And it's got some power at the you know, first, uh, the second harmonic, the third harmonic, and so on. And then you see a signal here, which is you notice that there were three little spheres on the top. Uh, we have three fist-sized spheres rotating outside the vacuum vessel, and it's the gravitational octopole coupling between those outer spheres and these inner spheres that provides us a known torque. 
whoops, sorry, going the wrong direction here. And uh, that provides this signal here. Okay? And then you see the signal from the, the, the detector ring, uh, 21 times frequency, 42, 63, 84, and so on. And then this curve here is the uh, expectation for the thermal power. Uh, we run at 300 Kelvin, remember. Uh, and that's the free resonance of the thing. The area under this curve is KT. Okay? So uh, we're seeing the Brownian motion here of something that weighs 33 grams. Okay? So, uh, and what happens here, this is our readout noise. Okay? So it, it kind of shows you the relative importance of different things here. The readout noise is actually, uh, in the current generation, uh, not our biggest problem. It would be great to have it better. Okay. But it's not our biggest problem. Uh, and you see what is the biggest problem here. If we get to a smaller separation, okay, you can see that the noise still has this characteristic 1 over f noise that you get from internal losses in the metal of the tungsten fiber. But you see its uh, noise power is 20 times or something bigger. And that is due to the electric field uh, that's present on these conductors. Okay? And people uh, who do cavity QED with little tiny ion traps okay, find that they also see excess noise. Now, they're interested in the megahertz frequencies, and we're interested in millihertz frequencies. But we think we're seeing manifestations, basically, of the same kind of thing. So this is a limitation for us right now. We have extra noise when we get close. Okay. You already for that. Uh, we've we, we we try. Okay. The, the contact potentials are very hard things to get rid of, as you obviously know from your question. Okay. But uh, the it doesn't. I'll show you more about it, uh, but it doesn't really uh, change that. Okay, so what we're uh, it, it changes the equilibrium position of the pe pe the pendulum uh, somewhat, but it doesn't change the uh, the noise. We okay, and uh, you know we measure things. Uh, most things. Uh, we, we measure uh, independently, uh, like separations by capacitances, uh, geometries. Uh, we measure with, uh, uh, you know, laser systems, smart scopes, and uh, coordinate measuring machines, and so on. Uh, and then we also, uh, some of them we measure gravitationally. For instance, uh, our data were fitted. Uh, and it told us that these holes here were two microns in radius larger than these machines told us they were. Okay? And uh, we spent some time worrying about this, and finally I realized it's the surface roughness uh, that was the problem. The machines measure the high points. Okay? Gravity averages over everything, and so gravity told us that these holes were actually bigger. <laughs> Than the, the you know than the fancy you know hundred thousand dollar machines uh, did, and this shows you just what you see. This uh, it, it, you see the sine wave here. That is uh, in this case we've kicked it up a little bit. It's seven times the thermal amplitude. Okay, and uh, then we apply a digital filter which uh, puts a notch in at uh, DC and at this frequency. And now you see the signal at 21 times the rotation frequency. Okay? And uh, you know, at the, until this was done, nobody could have told you that gravity was working right at these very small distances. Okay? But you see, we can measure it uh, reasonably, reasonably well. Okay? And uh, these just show you some data. Uh, what's plotted here on a linear scale is the amplitude of the torque. Uh, you know, amplitude. You know. The, the in-phase component of the signal. And you see the signal at 21 times rotation frequency has this funny behavior. This is due to the cancellation of the two components of the attractor, providing this 21 omega torque. Okay? At small distances, the, the nearby upper holes dominate. 
and that's why the signal goes positive. And at larger length scales, okay, a lar larger distances rather, uh, the more massive lower holes dominate, which is just what you expect. And they just cancel right here at a little over 100 microns. Okay? And uh, what's shown here is we also ran with, the un with just the upper attractor, uh, which is this line here, and with just the lower attractor, which is that line. They've both been divided by 20. And so you can see the amount of cancellation we have of Newtonian gravity. And this shows you the residuals that we see. And uh, there is something going on at these short distances, but it's not very reproducible. And we've done three separate experiments. We don't have any reason to throw anything away, although we don't necessarily think there's anything real here. And we, all our constraints are based on just accepting everything at face value. Okay? And uh, the constraints on a Yukawa violation of the inverse square law are shown right here, and the work we uh, just talking about is uh, is this constraint here. Everything above is uh, inconsistent with the data, okay? And it has this funny form because this part of it is based on the shape as a function of separation, and this part is based on an absolute measurement, if you like, of big G using this thing, okay? And uh, so that's why it has this funny, funny shape. Okay. And the dark energy length scale is right here. And uh, this is gravitational strength. Okay. So we have tested gravity uh, below the dark energy length scale. But uh, you know, it, it still stays interesting because there are general arguments why you might expect something to be at least as big as 20 microns. And uh, you say, what can you learn from this? Well, we know the inverse square law holds down to 56 microns. Uh, and uh, if you ask, how big could an extra dimension be and still uh, be consistent with the data, it can't be as any larger than 44 microns. And this is an interesting thing to theorists because they, they use this idea of large extra dimensions to solve all kinds of interesting problems, OK, you know, with neutrinos and this and that. But no matter what, you know, they have to show up in gravity. They may show up in gravity and neutrinos or in other things, okay, but they will always show up in gravity. And uh, the larger, the, the, the tighter limits you can place on their size, the less dramatic effect it has in these other applications as well. Okay? And uh, there are lots of uh, other arguments that I don't want to go through here because this, uh, this workshop is dealing a lot with uh, experimental things. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, we right now have two PhD students that are far along, and they each have their own experiment that is a follow-on on the one I told you about, okay? And this one we call a Fourier Bessel pendulum because you can solve uh, the gravitational and Yokawa interactions analytically, okay? This is a photomicrograph of uh, the attractor and the uh, detector. This is a 50 micron thick piece of tungsten. Okay? And this pattern has been electric discharge machined out of it. These holes were just for aligning the thing. The, a, afterwards, it's cut off, like here. And what you see is there are 120 spokes here. Okay? And there are 18 little wedges outside. Okay? And as the uh, attractor turns underneath the pendulum now, uh, there will be a signal at 120 times the rotation frequency from this set of holes, and a signal at 18 times the rotation frequency from that set of holes. Okay? And uh, if uh, the inverse square law holds, the divergence of little g is zero. And if something has a vanishing divergence, you know, uh, then if you uh, use cylindrical coordinates, uh, and you say it's got uh, 21 nodes going around this way, then that defines a length scale for the way the field dies off vertically, you know, which is inversely proportional to the number of nodes running around that way. And so what you expect as you rotate, as you, as you uh, predict the force that you would expect between these two things as one of them rotates underneath the other, you would expect it to more or less die off exponentially with a, with a rapid slope from these 120 spokes and with a slower 
uh, uh, x e folding length from the 18. And the ratio of those two is, uh, is a very nice signal. Okay? And uh, here you see this uh, foil, uh, the stretched foil. And now we've had an improvement. There's no longer this rim on it, so it's easier if a little piece of dust gets in there, A, to see it, and B, to get rid of it. And uh, all it takes is one little piece of dust in here, and then you, you will not get to the tiny separations we're talking about. And of course, we've made the separation big for the sake of the photograph here. Okay. And uh, th this just shows uh, how uh, Ted was measuring the geometry of this thing uh, with a uh, smart scope that uh, uses a laser beam that uh, scans across that thing. Okay. And here is some data from that. Uh, you can, and, and now, uh, to make a, a plot that you can see, we've wrapped the data around every 60 degrees, or, so, so it's been wrapped around. Okay, so, and here you can see, see you know, there are 20 peaks now in 60 degrees from 120 omega signal, and that's the rapid pattern, and the 18 is this modulation you can see here. Okay, so that's what the data and that's at a total separation of uh, 76 microns. Uh, and uh, Charlie Hagedorn is doing a very different kind of experiment that has very different uh, properties. This is now a top view, okay? And so the torsion fiber is coming out of the page here. And uh, there is a uh, approximation to an infinite plate, which has a high density material uh, on a low density backing. And the backing has some shims on the end to make the, uh, it, you know, correct uh, to, to some order, make this look more like an infinite sheet. It's steadily moved back and forward, okay, and the, the pendulum hangs at a constant distance from the foil in this case, which is a nice feature, uh, and uh, it has high density material uh, there and the lower density material there. If the inverse square law holds, and this were an infinite plate, then the field would be independent of distance as you move away from it. And uh, this pendulum would not uh, experience any torque that was in phase with the you know, displacement of the attractor. Uh, but if the inverse square law is violated, then there will be a force. And so this has the good feature that it's sort of measuring gravity, the big component of gravity. Uh, whereas in the experiment with the many holes, we're measuring the small component of gravity. The big component of gravity pulls straight down, and we're measuring the, the twist, the sideways component. So the signal is bigger here. Okay. The problem is uh, that the price you paid was that now your signal is at the disturbance frequency. Okay. And so it's, uh, it's got its good point, it's got its bad point. But I want to talk about this limiting factor of electrostatic noise. Okay, so there are some plots here from Kapner's thesis. Okay, and what's plotted is the uh, the, the 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 noise in the uh, in the angle measurement, the torque noise, basically. Okay, and you can see as you the noise runs along here at the uh, basically thermal value. And these were some points when things were being aligned. So, but then look what happens as you get closer. Okay, and uh, at different frequencies. So there's a, quite a similar thing that you see at, uh, at a, a bunch of different frequencies. I said it looks more or less uh, one over f. Okay, and uh, the question is, can we reduce this by operating at four Kelvin? Okay, and the uh, people that do uh, you know, uh, cavity QED uh, work uh, found that by cooling things down, their noise does get better. Okay? And so, uh, this is something we're, uh, we're 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 building a torsion balance that runs at 4K, among other things, to to test this uh, source of the noise. Okay? But this is a real issue. And uh, this just shows you uh, how uh, obvious the effects are. This was from a previous thesis experiment where we never got as close, okay? And you see the period was, uh, was quite constant, you know. Uh, and then this is from Kapner's where he gets close and you see how much the period changes. I mean, this is, the period is changing by, you know, uh, 
four seconds or something like that. And it's just, uh, as you get close, there's this complicated electrostatic landscape, you know, and there's a potential minimum somewhere. And so in addition to the torsion spring, you've got the uh, landscape spring, so to speak. Okay? And uh, so these are real uh, effects. Uh, if we move the, displace the pendulum a little bit, you can see the same kind of changes. Okay? So the, that over distance is characteristic of the microcrystals and so on. So these are uh, real uh, serious uh, I issues for us. Okay. Now, because this has to do with quantum things, I thought I would tell you about actually a, a very interesting idea, uh, which is to use ultra-cold neutrons, the quantum states of ultra-cold neutrons uh, in a gravitational field. Ultra-cold neutrons you know, are neutrons that I can run faster than their mean velocity. Their uh, wavelength is, you know, thousand micro, thousands of microns, and at these long wavelengths, uh, their interaction with matter can be treated with very good accuracy as an index of refraction, which may be complex. Okay? And uh, because their uh, scattering amplitude is negative, and at long wavelengths, it can the index can be, you know, the, for the negative contribution, can actually be bigger than one and it can have a negative index of refraction. A negative index of refraction means that you get total external reflection at all angles. Okay? So you can make a box, and these neutrons just rattle around inside. Okay? And so the idea is that you have a, a, a mirror here. Okay? Uh, made out of that, uh, most materials have this property. You, you, you make it very carefully, very pure, very flat. And you let the neutrons through, and they bounce. And so if this had an infinite Fermi potential, the effective potential that makes this index of refraction, you would just see the airy wave function of the neutrons bound in the gravitational field. Okay? And the first experiments, they just uh, vary the, uh, some slit where they let the, electron, uh, the neutrons go through. And as they make the slit narrower and narrower, they see the number of transmitted neutrons does not smoothly go to zero, but you can see the effects of the vertical wave function of the neutrons. Okay, but uh, the interesting proposal is uh, by these uh, people in the Granit uh, collaboration, where they want to m measure the excitation energy of the bound states of the neutrons. Okay, by applying RF magnetic fields. Now you can't do it with an RF magnetic dipole field, because the magnetic dipole fields like NMR, it flips the spin. But the gravity doesn't flip the spin, so the gravitational bound states all have the same spin. And so what you do is you need to have a uh, RF quadrupole field, so that now you don't necessarily couple the spins. Okay? And it's a, it's a really nifty idea. Uh, you know, the problems are you don't have large numbers of these neutrons. When people ask, how do we do so well in our gravitational experiments, they say there are two things. You know, one of them is symmetry. Our apparatus is always very symmetrical. And the other is Avogadro's number. OK, we've got a large number of, <laughs> uh, of atoms to deal with and uh, over uh, significant distances. So we tend to average out certain problems. But here, they don't have large numbers of these neutrons by this scale. But the virtue is that they are electrically neutral and unpolarizable. Okay? When people talk about doing this with cold atoms, they're talking about electrically neutral things, but highly polarizable. Okay? And you see the problems I showed you with uh, nominally <laughs> neutral things. Okay? It's a big problem. And so the virtue here is that uh, they don't have much counting rate but they have something which is really unpolarizable. And so they're going to be, uh, it's a very clean system. OK, now I'd like to go to the second uh, kind of topic. Uh, and that uh, is, uh, there are people that uh, think that maybe Lorentz symmetry uh, is uh, spontaneously broken at the Planck scale. Now, we all learned that uh, preferred frames were out, and it's a lovely idea that there are no such things. But how well do we really know that that's true, that there isn't something uh, 
that lets us know, uh, you know, how we're that the that the rest frame of the microwave background, say, isn't some kind of preferred frame. Okay, uh, it may not be, but you know, it would be nice to uh, to know how well this works. Okay. And uh, th there's a whole industry of people, uh, including uh, uh, experimenters here at the CFA, that are working on testing this notion. There's a, a, a theoretical industry of working out all the possible observables if this did happen, okay? And one of them uh, you don't need to be a, a theorist to appreciate is that how do you know there isn't some direction fixed in space uh, that a point fermion likes the point, I mean, like an electron, a spinning electron. Is there some direction fixed in space, okay? And if you had to ask uh, how, uh, what would you expect would be an interesting scale uh, that you'd have to reach to tell you something interesting, you'd say, well, if I want to know uh, how much energy might I expect that if there's some Planck scale phenomenon, uh, how much energy would it cost me to flip an electron spin about some fixed direction in inertial space? You know, your first guess is m e squared over m Planck, right? The standard particle physics kind of argument. Well, that energy is 2 times 10 to the minus 17 eV, okay? And, uh, uh, and then there's an even more interesting reason that uh, we didn't know till we until we have done our experiment, and I was giving a talk, and uh, somebody pointed out that there's this idea that the space-time coordinates might not commute. It's an old idea, and it was resurrected again in the string brain world theory people. Okay, the idea is suppose the x and y x and y don't commute, and they have a commutator that looks reminiscent of the Heisenberg uh, space I mean, momentum one. Okay. And uh, this uh, coefficient here has units of area in this case, okay, not units of h-bar. And uh, the way to understand what it means is that it says uh, that if you measure uh, uh, the x-coordinate of something with a certain uncertainty, and you measure the y-coordinate of the same thing with a certain uncertainty, okay, that the product of those uncertainties is, uh, can not drop below this value theta, just like in the Heisenberg relation. Okay? And so that means, in other words, this represents a certain minimum area that makes physical sense. Okay. And uh, what this has to do with the things I'm talking about is as follows. Uh, here are point, two points. We're going to go from A to B, and we go first along Y and then along X, or we go first along X and then along Y. If that commutator doesn't vanish, those two paths aren't equivalent. Okay? That means if you go around a complete circuit, you don't, com you don't get zero. Okay? And uh, that uh, should remind you of what a magnetic field does on a spin. Okay? If the spin's pointing one way and there's a magnetic field, you know. So it's l a non-commutative geometry is like there's something that has the properties of a magnetic field that's everywhere, uh, you know, defined in some f fixed direction. And so that there is an effective Lagrangian for a spin, okay, uh, spinning electron, say, where lambda is some cutoff parameter, which says, to what energy scale can you assume the electron is a point-like object? And the convention is to say, well, we know it's point-like at least up to a TeV, okay, so this lambda is a TeV. And then there's these, uh, you know, th this minimum sensible area, and then the electron spin, okay? So the, uh, here we have a very different kind of pendulum. Okay? This pendulum has uh, almost a mole of polarized electrons in it. And the way it works is it's basically a, you know, a complicated permanent magnet. Okay? So it contains four of these things, we call them pucks. Okay? And the pucks have a uniform magnetic field running around inside. And uh, half of the puck is an iron-like material, and the magnetization comes from two polarized d electrons. And the other is samarium cobalt-5. The cobalt in the samarium cobalt-5 is like iron. Its magnetization comes from two polarized d electrons. It's a neighbor of iron, okay? The samarium is in a three-plus ionic state, and uh, if you just, uh, it has five unpaired f electrons. And uh, if you just follow Hund's rules from atomic physics that tell you what the ground state configuration of something is, the electron spins want to be fully symmetric in order that the space function be anti-symmetric so no electrons stay on top of each other. That means the spin is five halves of a samarium, uh, 
the samarium at ion, and uh, the space wave function has to be as anti-symmetric as possible, and that means it has L equals 5, the spin g factor is 2, uh, and the orbital g factor is 1, so 5 halves times 2 is equal to 1 times 5, and Huns rules say at the beginning of a shell, those two magnetic moments, the moment from spin and the moment from orbital motion, are anti-parallel. So the, 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 the magnetization of samarium cobalt-5 has been measured, uh, and the samarium contribution to it is almost zero. Okay? So to a reasonable approximation, the spins of the, uh, of the iron here and of the cobalt there form complete circuits. Okay? And the spins of the samarium, which are pointing anti, uh, are uncanceled. Okay? So the, the iron and the cobalt make complete circuits, so there's no net spin dipole moment here. And the samarium moments are all more or less lined up. Okay? And then you put them here in this arrangement uh, where the magnetic fields run as the arrows are shown here. Okay? And uh, there, now there's equal amounts of uh, iron on the two sides, equal amounts of samarium cobalt on the two sides. We're insensitive to violations of the equivalence principle. The center of the total spin distribution of this thing is right in the center of the pendulum. It has lots of nice properties. Okay? And uh, my colleague Blaine Heckel is an absolute genius at uh, magnetics of all kinds. And uh, we have four layers of, uh, of co-rotating magnetic shield that sits inside Helmholtz coils that cancel the ambient field. We're obviously worried about magnetic systematics because any little ding in the surface here means that the flux won't all run around inside, but some will pop out at the little dings. And uh, if you machine something that has a Tesla of inherent field, you know, there are strong forces on it. Okay, I've got to, this is just a picture of the thing. Again, it's, uh, the thing inside is smaller than my fist. Okay. Uh, we found that there was a systematic, and the systematic meant that the spin wanted to point due south. The spin points in the opposite direction to the total angular momentum of this thing. The total angular momentum wants to point true north, and uh, that's the Coriolis force acting on these spins. Okay? So this little thing, about the size of, you know, the whole thing, the size of my fist, uh, it has angular momentum. Okay? It's a gyroscope sitting there. Nothing's moving, but it's a gyroscope. Okay? And we set an upper limit on the energy required to invert an electron spin, which is some numbers times 10 to the minus 22 eV, which is roughly almost 10 to the fifth times below this Planck length. Okay. And uh, I just, uh, I, 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 I should quit now, but uh, let me just give you a punchline. This little thing, okay, uh, says that area has to be so small that the square root of it, which is the length expressed in energy units, is 10 to the 13th GeV. And uh, there were people proposing to use E plus E minus colliders operating, you know, at GeV scale to test these ideas. And this little thing, <laughs> about the size of your fist, okay, actually gets to 10 to the 13th GeV, okay, which is kind of amusing. So I hope I have amused you, even if I'm not talking about what most of you are doing, but I'm hoping to learn from all of you. Thank you. Yes. Yes, those are spin. Exactly. The, the magnetic field uh, is closed loops. Okay. And <clears throat> we do that by, you can run the BH curve around in the iron, but the samarium cobalt is a very uh, hard magnet and you can't do much to it. And so we make the iron match the samarium cobalt. Right. There is a lot of give and a lot of interest, okay. Um, I can, you know, there are people that talk about all kinds of things, uh, using BECs, uh, using cold atoms, okay. Uh, I, I told you my take is that anytime you have something that's polarizable, you've got problems, okay. 
so I don't know. I don't know how well uh, a any of us will be able to do. Uh, I am convinced of one thing, and that is if you don't have a isolating shield between your detector, whatever it is, and what's the, the attractor underneath, okay, which you've got to modulate, okay, you will not succeed in measuring gravity. And then uh, this, the fact that you had to use uh, you know, polycrystalline material yes, as a shield, right. does that then immediately tell you that you shouldn't you have use some, some kind of single crystal? Um, right. Uh, so, so that's a very uh, a, a straightforward conclusion to draw. Uh, Lamoureux did some experiment um, where he was recently, I mean, like last few years, where he used germanium, I think it was, to try to measure the Casimir force better. Okay, and the argument that again, the single crystal nature should uh, get rid of a lot of these problems. But he still had problems, and I don't want to, I don't know necessarily, but it wasn't a panacea. It wasn't a panacea. Okay, but you know, I think we've got to try to do things like here saying, try a, 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 a single crystal. Okay. The, um, you, you need a reasonable conductivity so that the, uh, that the skin depth doesn't get too long. In other words, you, you want it to shield out the... Uh, yeah. Okay, that's a good question. That, that, that's Im important. One thing we're trying to do with this uh, combination of 120 uh, omega and 18 omega is to make it so it doesn't matter so much what the distance is because they're more or less exponential slopes. Uh, okay. But it, it's an important measurement, and uh, it's done in the following way. We measure the capacitance between the pendulum and the foil, you know, the, the shield foil. And that gives us uh, that separation. We know the thickness of the shield foil. And then we measure the capacitance and also optically between the, uh, the shield foil and the uh, attractor. Okay, so it's putting those m m measurements together. Uh, and uh, it's, not a, it's a very good question because it's less trivial than you think because uh, <laughs> If the temperature at which you measured, uh, the th for instance, if you compare the optical to the to the capacitance measurement, okay, uh, and then once the thing is put in your apparatus, you're just confined to measuring capacitance because now you can no longer measure the other one in your apparatus. Uh, the, if you don't measure, I mean. We have to hold the temperature of the thing constant while we're measuring the uh, the thing on the smart scope, okay? Just because the difference in thermal expansion of the materials, you know, which are about 10 centimeter length, uh, is non-negligible. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>